I want to repeat my prior warning. I'm making you play a very dangerous game, Conrad. Even if you succeed. Religions have proven themselves to be a wonderful blessing to mankind. And a terrible curse. All we want is something that will outlast the wars. But if we're not careful, we'll make a monster. There hasn't been a true religious war in centuries. And if you prove too good at creating zealots, mankind might yet see another. You'll have to try to keep it within certain limits to avoid escalations. With terrible consequences. Comstar, a name which holds with it a historied legacy. For much of the history of Battletech, from the Succession Wars forward, it was a mysterious organization which held onto arcane technologies and controlled the flow of communications across the whole of the Inner Sphere, acting as the seemingly neutral observer at the heart of it all, before the clan invasion. Comstar and its hidden army, the Comguard, would save the Inner Sphere, fighting against their fellow Star League descended counterparts, the clans. These two very alien societies, both to each other and to the rest of humanity, fought for the very fate of the Inner Sphere. Comstar would then split. But why did this happen? So much of this is a mystery to many. Some believe Comstar to be a simple interstellar communications organization, perhaps with elaborate spies. But Comstar is more, much more. For it, and only it, has the truth as to mankind's destiny in the stars, given to them by Blake himself. At least, that's what the inducted believe. So, let us start from the beginning. Where did this all come from? Inevitably, war would return. That is the lesson of the last 40 years, Conrad. We're not ready. Mankind is not ready. We advanced too swiftly. We've gotten too good at war, but we haven't matured any. There will always be those at the periphery of power who resent those at the center, geographically or metaphorically. And there will always be those with power who abuse it, and harm those without it. We've got to let it burn out, Conrad. Mankind needs an object lesson to realize what it's capable of. And then we need never forget. I thought for a while that the storm would pass swiftly. But look at how many worlds have been outright murdered. Look at how swiftly they have destroyed the very means to travel the stars, to purify water. It all has to burn out before we can expect them to learn. It took me a long time to realize it. Kerensky saw it. But I just wasn't ready to believe. There was nothing. It was all gone. The Ameris Civil War was in a word... Apocalyptic. The very center of the Inner Sphere had been leveled in the war. The scale of the violence and the inhumanity of the conflict had permanently scarred those who survived the barbarity of Ameris's coup, and failed bid to control the Terran core of the Star League. The self-declared First Lord had fought against his famous rival, General Alexander Karensky, until his very position was overrun on Terra after years of the bloodiest fighting in the Inner Sphere's history up until that point. But what was left behind? 
What became of the now liberated Terran state at the center of it all? To call it a husk would be a mistruth so enormous that it would shake the inner sphere to its foundations. The Terran hegemony, even if it existed in some loose capacity as an idea now that the Ameris Empire was gone, was a corpse. Its heart no longer beat, its brain gave almost no signals of activity, and it was because the things that made the state the state were simply gone. The brilliant administrative minds and leaders of industry had been made examples of at the slightest sense of dissension. The intellectuals among them had been forced into superweapons efforts, or put to use as manual laborers to make defenses, before being executed, or being used as human shields against the SLDF along with other civilians. This was then compounded when the Terran hegemony was liberated. The vengeful SLDF, or citizens, then held enormous numbers of the remaining elites and administrators accountable for their seeming collusion with Stefan Ameris, taking no account into the dress that those administrators had faced in all of this as well. The industries of the once mighty empire themselves had been destroyed in the fighting. The muscles the now defunct brain utilized were left a bloody ruin. Worse still was the seemingly endless numbers of dead. Civilians paid the price for the war more than anyone, and many of those who were useful to keeping the society running were killed in the fighting, or repressed into dangerous levels of service that saw their own demise. This meant that there were endless missing personnel to do jobs, especially in complex work which people didn't know how to do on their own and required training. The former empire would now see people struggling just to feed themselves or these people had no means to rebuild after such a calamitous conflict that saw its vital infrastructure damaged or destroyed. This was the husk that was left of the former Terran alliance and Terran hegemony. The vultures from beyond, the Great Houses, were already beginning to pick at this corpse. These neighboring powers, in theory member states of the League, were taking worlds along the edges for occupation as early as the invasion itself as they prepared to settle scores with one another, and pressed to make themselves the new masters of the realm. In this unfolding nightmare, one man who had bravely helped serve the liberators of Terra had been Jerome Blake. A man in his late 20s at the beginning of the conflict, he and only a relative handful of others had been the main communications technicians not within Amaris's grasp, or dead from the Terran hegemony. Blake, who would go on to become a deified figure by Comstar after its formation, would become a vital member of those around Kerensky during the campaign, if only because he was doing everything that he could to keep the SLDF in communication with each of its components, and even leading advanced teams to reactivate HPG nodes despite the risk to himself. Communications are vital to civilians as they are to military assets. And this effort not only saved millions of lives, but ensured that Kerensky's war efforts were able to continue operations effectively. This work is a part of what may have shortened Blake's lifespan, and gave him a permanent head trauma which caused him to pass out in short comas at various points going forward. The event which caused this happened on Oliviette, where Blake personally led a service team into what he thought was a secured portion of a war zone to bring communications back under Star League control. Sadly, they would come under fire from the Rimworld's army, which had managed to break through into the defensive ring around their position. The resulting attack killed three of his team, and caused the aforementioned injury. Blake was scarred by the war, physically, as millions of others were as well. He was simply one of many who paid the price for Ameris' greed, and the Cameron's folly. Only the price he paid wasn't as colossal as many others who starved, or died mutilated on the battlefield. But with the passing of the war itself, all that was left was the wreckage. Blake had been hopeful when he first saw the conditions of the HPG equipment on Terra, after its liberation. Seeing some of the advanced systems which had been worked on prior to the war hadn't been damaged by Ameris' occupation. But this was an island of good news and a sea of despair. Only the full gravity hadn't all set in yet. The Star League still lived, in theory, but for how long? In the aftermath of all this, in 2780, Blake would find that his understanding of the communication network and administration resulted in his nomination to Minister of Communications in the Star League. Funnily enough, 
Blake wasn't actually aware of his nomination to the role or even his confirmation during the proceedings of the Council Lords in Unity City after the destruction of the Amaris Empire. The appointment of Jerome Blake to the role of Minister of Communications is the only thing the Lords of the Star League ever agreed upon in any meaningful way. The only other major thing they did was dismiss Kerensky as Protector of the Realm, though that wasn't for another ten months. Over the year, the Lords negotiated with one another on various issues. Who would be the first Lord among them? This ended in nothing, and resulted in the council members retreating to their home territories to prepare themselves for the war they had all been planning for, or planning to enact, for the better part of a generation, long before Amaris took power. There was nothing to stop it now, only a few people had hope that it wouldn't come to pass. But hope was the only thing that they had to rely on. During all of this, the increasingly defunct, war-torn, and neglected Terran state was in complete freefall without any form of official leadership to solve its immense problems. Kerensky would not lead, not without the approval of the First Lords. So despite not knowing much about Jerome Blake, citizens would even beg for the Minister of Communications to take on the role of Director General, or anything, simply to provide a hierarchy and leadership to the now hopeless state. Riots and protests filled many streets across the battle-worn cities and planets of this realm, even on Terra itself, which had been left in disrepair by the House Lords. Jerome would have an awakening, in a state of near disbelief, as to the scale of the absolute state of ruin that everywhere was in, especially after his administrative eye looked over the data he received. There was nothing, as stated earlier. Cities were desolated or stripped of all their resources. Farmers lay dead in their fields, shot or forced to give so much that none of them could feed themselves having been ordered to triple their yields or face death. The intellectuals had died in huge numbers, and their projects were frozen or seized, or those responsible for them were in no state to continue with anything. Society had, for all purposes, entered into a state of shock and was barely able to operate. The entire system of logistics that kept this once mightiest state in the Star League in full operation functionally had ceased to exist. Grasping the scale of the disaster which had unfolded far beyond what he had seen in the wars, and realizing that nothing had been done by the very lords of the Star League who should have been responsible, the man Comstar considered their savior would reach out to the House Lords in desperation to have them appoint someone to oversee Reconstruction, and at least attempt to reorganize what was left of the state. Jerome was never a man who sought power or leadership. It was always something he fell into from his work ethic, knowledge, reliability, and even in this venture he did not ask for such a role for himself, just for anyone to take charge in some official capacity. Responses to his pleas were, to say the least, bleak. Each house lord replied flippantly or without any sense of urgency regarding the fate of those in the state and what was happening and those that bothered to engage with him in any further way told him simply to do the job himself until they convened the council once more to agree to appoint someone. The last point was finally something Jerome was realizing was never likely to happen again. Jerome would save countless lives through taking charge of the situation, using his HPG stations to take on census data for the current situation across the Terran Empire. He would begin to try to triage the crisis, moving food, water, and other resources between worlds with his administrative powers to feed the masses who had been left to starve. The Star League Defense Force, even now without Kerensky officially in charge, helped in this endeavor, using their fleet and manpower to assist moving these goods. After taking up the reins for the betterment of the people of his nation, for all intents and purposes, Jerome Blake was the Director General just without the title. The people themselves knew this, and Blake's name was only further emboldened by the beaten and broken populace as things did start to, gradually inch by inch, improve within the devastated territory. The rebuilding of Terra would become the central focus of Blake's efforts, 
as he believed after the home of mankind had been restored to even a shadow of its former self, rather than a blasted, battered, barely livable hull in the void of space, the other worlds nearby could be restored after this was achieved, and then beyond that the rest of the hegemony. There needed to be a base somewhere for manufacturing, communications, administration, and everything else. Terra would be that hub, and it was the first in his vision to be restored. Knowing the tragic fate of Unity City, the Camerons, and now the Council's increasing behavior though, Blake would cease all reconstruction on the city. The Court of the Star League itself would be sealed as this place was left abandoned, outside of maintenance to some of the surrounding locations to ensure this grave of the Star League was still in some form, rather than being allowed to be completely reclaimed by nature. Blake gave the following decree. The devastation and death that remained in the once proud capital carries a taint that only centuries can cleanse. Until a new First Lord is appointed, the court shall remain sealed. It turns out his words were prophetic. The process by which the Inner Sphere would be ignited once more into war this time one far worse than the Ameris Civil War by scale alone, was taking place. The SLDF was being sidelined. House Lords were building up their already substantial militaries. Veterans from the war, both Ameris' remaining troops and SLDF troops even, were becoming mercenaries and being pledged to various houses. In 2783, Kerensky met with Blake once more at a ceremony going over the completion of the Hilton Head HPG, the true center of communications in the Inner Sphere, the completion of the project which Blake had discovered upon his return to Terra. The private meeting had several notes on it, though we know later from Blake's own words, it was tense. They would speak several more times, it appears, after this, and in their last communications, things were said that could not be taken back. This unfolded because Alexander Kerensky informed Jerome that he was leaving. Not just Terra, but the Inner Sphere. He didn't intend to leave alone either, as he wished to persuade the SLDF to leave with him. Over 80% of the standing Star League Defense Force opted to leave with Kerensky in his exodus, which amounted to over 90 divisions. I admit I was angry with Kerensky and de Chavier. I felt abandoned. You know as well as I do that Kerensky could have made a run at it as First Lord. When he didn't, I held it against him. Then I wanted him to stay close, at least, so that he could intervene when the time was right. But after a few months of that, he told me I was a dreamer. The last messages we exchanged were heated. I regret that. He was a good friend. Alexander explained as well that the House Lords had sacked him when he found out about them trying to lure SLDF units into their own forces, and protested over this. From that moment forward, he'd seen what was coming and believed none could prevent it. Their sacking of Kerensky was the only act, beyond making Blake the Minister of Communications, that was seemingly a unanimous decision. One rose as the other fell. Knowing what awaited the hegemony when the SLDF departed, even in its diminished state, Jerome would beg Kerensky not to undertake what he was planning. The assurance he received in response was Kerensky would ask those who wished to stay behind to stay and protect the Terran state, and help with the reconstruction. We know that Jerome, regardless of how things seemed to end between himself and Alexander, still held true to his friend enough to not tell the House Lords what Alexander was doing. Despite whatever was said, that he believed did so much damage between the two of them, he held Kerensky's secret. We know that Kerensky too honored his promise to Jerome Blake, as most of those in the SLDF who remained honored Kerensky's wishes and would pledge themselves to the remains of the state. Kerensky and the SLDF, on November 5th, 2784, departed the Inner Sphere.
mankind will have to burn among the stars, and maybe then we can progress once again. I lost centuries of progress during the medieval period, and had to relearn everything. But maybe now, we have a shortcut. As long as Comstar remains a vault of knowledge, we may one day be able to teach mankind when they are ready. The first circuit would be established three days after Kerensky's exodus. Among the representatives that would arrive to this new council, essentially what would become the governing body of Comstar, was a young technician named Conrad Toyama, the man who would eventually succeed Jerome Blake decades later, and one who would be left with an impossible task. But he did not have that task yet. The governing entity which Jerome Blake envisioned was forged in this meeting, combining the Department of Communication with its corporate entities into one single body. It's so strange that in all of this, the hegemony was under the rule of a man who was a brave telecommunications operator and administrator. He was no general, like Kerensky. Nor was he noble, born to rule as the Camerons had been. Jerome Blake, the now prime administrator of Comstar, was a man who simply felt a duty to his people and to the Star League. Even if his government wasn't entirely recognized, Jerome had saved millions, and all because he refused to see so many suffer for so little reason and he was the only one who took charge to do so. Regardless of his other faults, or the mistakes he made, Blake did something few people ever could. He was brave enough to help people, rather than waiting for others. People followed him because he gave them hope, even before he was deified. Over the following two years, the First Circuit governed not only Terra, but much of the still remaining hegemony and they continued to expand the revitalized HPG network out to an ever greater number of worlds. But the abyss was rapidly approaching. House armies were now prepared, and the scale of horror that was coming was known to Blake, who had only a handful of necessary units to protect the Terran hegemony. He had lied to the House Lords, informing them that all of the SLDF had left, and had hidden away the remaining assets of the SLDF, which he had access to and they were now centered around the former 151st Royal Battle Mech Division, which had been at one time nicknamed the Ulysses S. Grant Division. With the Royal Division at their core, these forces saw the Hegemony and Terra as their home. It must have been painful for these men and women to realize that they were tasked with protecting billions across dozens of stars, but truthfully, they could only protect a handful in what was to come. During this, it would be Major General Lauren Hayes, one of the heroes of the Ameris Civil War, someone who even paid for the liberation of Terra with the loss of her own hand, who would be left in the overall command of the forces left to the hegemony. It's hard to describe the size of the burden she must have felt in this role, and also the size of the challenge. The last light of the Star League and Terran State didn't just remain in the hands of the administrators like Jerome Blake, or the First Circuit, but it was also in the hands of the military servicemen and women who didn't turn their backs on their homes. If their will faltered, if Lauren Hayes' will faltered, there would be nothing left. In the gathering storm, they would have to watch as many of their homes came under house occupation from the outside, and watch the brutal destruction being unleashed once more, with the goal of safekeeping this light. Lauren Hayes would be their captain to weather the storm, they were the last wall against the sea. The waves of what was the succession war were coming. These last defenders could already see it building, threatening everyone and everything, and soon they would see it crash all around them. In the winter of 2786, Prime Administrator Jerome Blake called for a meeting amongst the First Circuit to discuss the future, and a future that they had to try to hold for the sake of their nation. Blake saw things through the lens of technology, statistics, history, and administration, more than just through the politics of the day, necessarily. Blake feared that all they had done to restore anything, and most of all Terra, was about to be undone by the House Lords in their lust for power. In this meeting with the Circuit, he brought them to outline a future that they could do to try to preserve themselves, and the communications network which humanity itself needed. A simple plan by design, 
but one which was exceedingly difficult to execute. Blake proposed Operation Silver Shield. This would be a dangerous affair, as Blake's plan was to persuade the Great Houses to agree to Comstar's neutrality in any coming conflict, and not to attack or interfere with their facilities, property, or personnel. Next was an attempt to formalize that Comstar could issue a letter of credit for currency in exchange, with the houses for all communications or technical services. Finally, it was to seize Terra and as many planets around Earth as possible for the new state that they would have to form. Perhaps this latter part was to add insulation to the core of Terra, but truthfully it may have been to try to save as many people of the hegemony from the fate they would all experience once the storm washed over them. Sadly, the latter piece of the plan would be reduced to one world, as they simply had too precious little to spare. He would meet with the House Lords, acquiring their approval one by one, though he deceived them at every turn, informing them that others had already agreed to certain conditions, or by not explaining the whole of his plan. But inevitably this had, in fact, worked. At least in theory. Each agreement would be certified by a signature in what would become known as the Communications Protocol of 2787, and set forth Comstar's neutrality by law and treaty. What's most impressive is he managed this after Minomaru Karita declared himself First Lord of the Star League which resulted in others to follow suit. What was known as the First Succession War had already begun. In 2788, Operation Silver Shield was enacted on a military level, with the SLDF remnants, as well as several mercenary units, starting a campaign on Terra to secure the planet. In theory, Terra was already governed by Comstar, but House forces had been deployed to the planet in the name of internal security. Also, two Star League infantry divisions, despite seemingly being pledged to the hegemony, did not consider themselves pledged to Comstar. All HPG transmissions were cut for the duration of the operation. The conflict that emerged on Terra's surface was one draped in silence despite the rumble of guns in the distance. The crushing of most of the house forces was quick and brutal. Caught unaware, these house soldiers from the Free Worlds League, Capellan Confederation, Draconis Combine, and Lyran Commonwealth would be overwhelmed by the superior force with haste. Major General Hayes would only see two major portions of resistance. First, in Europe, the Federated Sons had been able to realize the circumstances before the others. A battle broke out in Berlin, Germany, which lasted hours as some of the armed forces of the Federated Sons traded shots with the forces of Comstar. Though they fought valiantly, they would inevitably be encircled and destroyed inside of the city by these new Guardians of Terra. After this, functionally, no house forces remained on world. More serious fighting was found in South America, against the two SLDF infantry divisions. They took rapidly to the jungles in the continent and dug in. Hayes, in a rush to complete the operation, foolishly sent mechs to deal with the problem in a shock attack, and saw her troops take on heavy losses and material attrition before being forced to pull back. The problem was such, however, that there would be no attempt to siege these soldiers to starve them out. They would have to be defeated, meaning captured or killed. The 13th Royal Infantry Division was marshaled, along with the remnants of the 251st Battle Mech Division's 3rd Regiment to complete this task. Brutal jungle fighting broke out, with both sides fighting like devils, both for their ideals. In this intense exchange, soldiers, both loyal to the Star League, killed one another in some of the worst fighting conditions on the planet. Heavy losses were incurred by both sides in this bloodbath, but it would be the two divisions that would surrender to Comstar, laying down their arms. 72 hours had passed. Terra was secured. Communications came back to life. The entirety of the battles that took place had been filmed, as per Blake's orders, and with this, transmissions were broadcast to the entirety of the Inner Sphere displaying the military takeover on Terra, and showing the full force of what had been brought to bear in order to make this happen. It was not just informing the houses as to what had happened, 
It was a promise of what would happen should an attack on Terra take place. Comstar had a military, and it had teeth. It would defend itself and make any attacker pay, and pay dearly. The now former Lords of the Star League, who were now all in the process of now invading the truly dead Terran hegemony, were stunned by this brazen act by Jerome Blake, but none of them made a move to attack him. Yet. They were all too busy still fighting what resistance there was on Terran worlds, but also now fighting with one another. It is likely most of them simply believed that they would deal with the others first, before dealing with Little Blake and his forces. Prior to Operation Silver Shield, the Free Worlds League and Draconis Combine both had their eyes on Terra for military expansion and conquest. Should Terra not have been seized by Comstar and displayed its barb so prominently, the birthplace of man would have been a war zone at least twice, with major house forces to make a play for it on its surface. The destruction it would have wrought would have sealed the fate for mankind's ability to understand technology, or even to preserve knowledge in general. Despite the tragedies of Operation Silver Shield, insofar that many people had to fight and die, it was necessary to preserve what was left of the Star League in the Inner Sphere. They succeeded, and saved Earth. In the aftermath of this, the House Lords would make their displeasure known by transmission, but little changed. An expedition was sent to New Earth, the former headquarters of the Star League Defense Forces, and their facilities were stripped for anything approaching value. Weapons, electronics, parts, anything. All of it was uplifted in quick order, before being brought home to Terra and being placed in storage with great care. These weapons were the last line of defense, the last insurance policy for Comstar's rule over Terra should any of the Warring Houses make a mad bid for the planet. Hang in there, old friend. I still haven't told you about the Gabriel base, and why it took until 2802 to turn a profit. Following the end of the threat to Terra, the planet would largely be at peace for centuries going forward. At the beginning of this, though, Comstar faced financial problems. Much of the network had been constructed using loans from the Star League, which had been held by the Great Houses and other parties. And despite the complete disillusionment of the League by this point, barring stated claims of arrogant house lords, monies were still owed. Great deals of monies were still owed, in fact. This created a complication for Comstar to deal with, namely because they only had a few sources of revenue. First, taxes could be procured from Terra, and second, service contracts with various entities requiring communications or certain forms of repairs across the Inner Sphere. Thanks to Comstar having the ability to issue out its own currency for exchange, as well as offering services, and of course, controlling the rate and flow of communication, with extremely careful work, Blake and others were able to manipulate markets in such a way for the duration of several years to always earn a greater return for Comstar in its financial operations, until it was not only able to generate enough of its own revenue, but it was able to pay off its vast debts for reconstruction efforts it overseen all the same. In 2802, Comstar finally made good, emerging as a financial juggernaut on the scene of the Inner Sphere. Expansion continued with the reopening of more of the HPG grid over time, though the periphery would always receive the least priority for expansion. This seemed to be simply a shrewd business strategy due to the lack of income that could be generated in the periphery. But there is some evidence against this. Journals from Blake revealed his deeply seated distrust for the periphery, and even his hostility for it, personally holding these realms responsible for the death of the Star League, a state and institution which Jerome genuinely loved. During all of this expansion and prosperity, the Comstar Credit, which would later become the Sea Bill, would become the main medium of currency exchange between houses and major corporations across the Inner Sphere due to its reliability and the impartial nature of Comstar. 
as well as the consistent need for the company's service, which could only be paid in sea bills. Controls within the organization, either at its stations or on Terra, became increasingly locked down as the Inner Sphere descended into barbarism and backwardness, especially with their own loss of technology. ROM, Comstar's internal security services, would form originally to prevent the loss of technology, secrets, or defections of personnel to outside parties like the Great Houses or Periphery States. This organization became something in the back of anyone's mind within Comstar, knowing full well that ROM seemed omnipresent and would punish any act of sedition or treachery. This intelligence service would be responsible for protecting many of the assets of Comstar abroad, across the Inner Sphere. The Great Houses all coveted what Comstar now had, and there were notable incidents, in particular from the Capellan Confederation, where the Great Houses would attempt to steal or seize Comstar assets. Rom not only protected Comstar from within, but also from without, being used in covert operations against outside entities. It would evolve into the most proficient intelligence services in the setting, at least until the breakup of Comstar itself. All you need is a saint. It won't do to martyr me without a shrine, Conrad. You can't spread my ashes. You'll have to make a tomb for my corpse. On May 15th, 2819, Jerome Blake would die. He had suffered from his condition more severely over a short period of time. The legacy of his service trying to stop the madman Stefan Amaris, seemingly. But that very condition hid what was really killing him which was a rare genetic disorder. Some of the issues he'd been experiencing had not been related to his head injury, but this slow killing illness. On the day of his death, he would be met by his now longtime friend and associate, Administrator Conrad Toyama. The two would have a conversation about where the path had started and the realities of where it had to go. Comstar faced an impossible task before it, not just having to run an interstellar communications business, or governing the cradle of mankind, but preserving what had been lost in the nightmares that had unfolded since the day that Stefan Amaris shot Richard Cameron in his throne room. It was to preserve mankind's knowledge, particularly its technology, but also its broader intellectual and cultural thoughts. If they did not do this, then the inner sphere, and by extension humanity, would have lost so much that they would never fully recover, even after the wars ended. But Jerome, a very humble man by most accounts, had, even before his death, begun to realize the limitations of what Comstar was in its current form. Nothing lasts forever. People would become dissuaded with monetary compensation, or would slowly erode in their loyalties over time, especially without a purpose consistently greater than their own. Secular institutions, even those like the Star League, seem to lose their way. The best way for the vision of Comstar to be completed would be for it to not simply be a corporate state, but for it to be a religious organization, a theocracy. I've been working on this for the last few months now. One's got my actual journals. The ones I've kept for years now. The other is a new version you're going to use. I've designed them to put everything that's happened in the last few years into a common perspective. I've even retroactively installed some predictions and hindsight informed observations to give it a bit of prophetic flavor. But the truth is, is things have been happening the way that Kerensky and myself to a lesser degree predicted anyway. These new journals are a bit unfinished and rough. I wasn't expecting to need them this early, but they'll still do the job. If you fill in the blanks, they'll allow you to keep the mission alive when I'm gone. They'll allow you to hoist up the idea of a Blake who never really existed but who can act as an unassailable martyr. 
You'll cash in on my cult of personality as well as the culture of reluctance to speak ill of the dead. And if you're quick enough, you'll have a religious organization. Blake in particular, though, did not want to create something filled with zealots and fanatics. A fine line would need to be walked in all of this. They needed to be just fervent enough to embrace the goals of the preservation of knowledge, and just benign enough not to descend into religious wars, or be so fanatical that they would lose their way. Toyoma was aghast hearing all of this, and was horrified by his friend's plans, but slowly started to consider what Blake was saying in the conversation. It started to make sense. In Blake's hospice, in the last day of his life, Toyama would agree to fulfill his friend and mentor's dying wish, and would be the one to hold the torch for what would become Comstar, a religious order, and one which he knew from the moment of its creation was founded on a lie. But it was a lie which Blake believed would save the Inner Sphere, and Toyama started to believe it too. The religion was never even meant to last forever. It was there to be what Comstar had been so far, a strong point against the waves of chaos consuming mankind all around them. It was only going to be there long enough to wait for the fever to break, and to contain much of what had been lost for when mankind was finally ready to advance beyond what it had been, even if it meant that his organization, at times, needed to keep wars going, and needed to deprive others of knowledge. It was all done with the broader picture of the future in mind. We've had too many false starts over the centuries. So if billions must bleed and burn and die now, it's our responsibility to ensure that cost isn't wasted. We can't let conflict die down too long until we're absolutely sure that we expect something better, rather than just more of the same. If that demands action on our part, so be it. It cannot compromise the ultimate mission. We have to embark on a long play here. A five-year plan won't do. We need a 500-year plan. Blake, by the end of all of this, had become too jaded. He'd been lied to, or seen failings in the other powers and humanity too many times. The humanity he'd sacrificed for. Blake always believed, until the very moment of his death, that one day humanity would rise above what it had been, and would be ready for the future it deserved, one of peace, prosperity, and reason. He believed this so much that he gave up his own personal desires and goals, and lived a life in service for others. But on his deathbed, he had realized that all of that sacrifice had never accomplished what he had wanted. To save the Star League. He was, in reality, of the rulers of the Inner Sphere, the only one who had fought for the League, and what he saw as the well-being of mankind. I have been a symbol for years now, but I haven't been myself for most of my life. Always in the service of others, for the greater good. Meeting someone else's expectations. I was a little genius, and my parents made sure that I went to school. I graduated at 16, but I've had no life and no love. All I've ever had is a career and a crisis. There was a twist in Jerome's face, showing an anger and a sorrow left buried to all those but himself for much of his life. The tragic years of the Civil War, the failed rebuilding effort, the desperate attempt to save people from the ambitions of short-sighted house lords, the people being those he and others had sacrificed so much for during that civil war. It all showed its way through. Why should I care now how I'm remembered? When I've barely lived at all! It appeared as though his confidant, his friend, Conrad was about to speak, 
to say something to him to console him, but Blake gestured for him to cease, and then continued, his voice now almost somber. My chance has come and gone. But if one more sacrifice can be made useful, well, I believe it's worth some slight discomfort on my part, or yours. During his discussion with Toyama, Jerome Blake would pass away. He was survived only by the memories and thoughts of his friends, colleagues, and the people of Comster who had fought so hard for him. Toyama, as per his dying wish, would see to it that he was survived by more than just that. I give it a day, Jerome. No more. I'm a fraud, and they'll know it. He exhaled, and as the air left him, a new weight settled on his mind. He walked through the door. Conrad smiled grimly. Forgiveness was a creative force, but so was anger. He felt comfort as his mind set itself on familiar problem-solving patterns. He loved affecting change. Every problem could be solved by just parsing it into smaller problems, which could be defeated in turn. Outside the first circuit would meet someone new and never had seen before. They would meet Toyama the Tyrant. He knew each of them, and they would prove unable to resist him. The outcome known, it was now but a matter of implementation. Conrad Toyama would be declared by written note to be Jerome Blake's successor. In the world itself, there were questions as to if this was fraudulent or not. But truthfully, Blake did appear to sign the declaration that Toyama should be made Prime Administrator, and none questioned this claim to the role. He immediately set about consolidating power and information, because Toyama learned well from his teacher that information was power. All of Blake's personal journals were seized and placed under his personal control, something which Blake himself had wanted, as many were already heavily edited with his more religious, prophetic accounts of events. Toyama had to finish the work before publishing it further. Blake's will and final testament were read, including his express wishes to have his body cremated and his ashes spread at the court of the Star League. Toyama instead would do as his mentor had asked him in their final meeting, and declared that Blake's body would be placed into a special tomb on Hilted Head Island as a shrine, and one which attempted to give his corpse almost lifelike properties, as well as put in open display as an inspiration for all those who served under Comstar. The consolidation of power, however, would be where Conrad would face opposition even if his ascension to the Prime Administrator hadn't been opposed. He started using Blake's journals as evidence for where the organization should go, placing Blake into a messiah-like position in his arguments, including using these to support his position that Comstar would continue to be as isolationist as possible, before re-emerging at a later time, decades or centuries later, to rebuild civilization. Oyama particularly hammered home this idea, acting more as a religious firebrand than as an administrator. Some of his colleagues, people of reason in their own way, were less than enthusiastic or impressed, particularly Administrator Herman Schweppes, the administrator of New Earth Circuit. Schweppes himself had his own set of delusions, however. Even during the First Succession War, he believed that Comstar had the ability, by force of arms, to force the houses into submission with their hidden stores of weapons, and several in the First Circuit agreed with him. In July of 2819, while in a First Circuit Council meeting, he and his cohorts would make this position known, and drafted a plan to do this very thing. It's likely they were desperate, much like many were, for the return of the Terran Hegemony and Star League, and believed far too much in their ability to make such a thing a reality. The truth was, even in their diminished states, the houses would overwhelm such a push, and even if they succeeded, it would quickly descend into more destruction and war. 
Administrator Sweps and the others had felt this way for some time, and always felt Blake would have been an obstacle. Only with him gone now did they make their beliefs known fully, and in opposition to Conrad's push for neutrality. In response to this, in one of, if not the most bizarre administrative meetings of this sort of any kind, Conrad Toyama would openly, far more than before, declare that Jerome Blake had prophesied that the Inner Sphere would be consumed by generations, if not centuries, of war, and that, as foretold prior, it would be they who would reach out to the stars and save mankind, as the great rebuilders of civilization, and the builders of a new, grand Star League, united in knowledge and a new human spirit. Now Toyama confirmed to the circuit that Comstar's goal wasn't simply one of a bold plan to help mankind under the guise of a corporation, but it was a sacred mission given to them by the most wise and divine mind of Jerome Blake, who had departed from the mortal plane after delivering the last of his celestial insight. Jerome had finished his part of their collective duty by delivering this unto them, and they could now walk the spiritual and revered path towards the salvation of not only themselves, but of all mankind. During all of this, many in the council would realize that it appeared that Toyama was being sincere in what he was saying. To add to the First Circuit's confusion, he would display the now published, in book format, Sacred Journals of Jerome Blake, which he claimed would be the new holy text for all to read, and claimed all which he had delivered to them so far could be substantiated by Blake's very word within the now religious tome. He then ended this extremely irrational speech, calling for Administrator Schweppes to resign. The rest of the circuit went absolutely quiet, not saying anything for almost five minutes. And Herman too, the man asked to resign, remained stone cold quiet himself. To be clear, all of these people knew Jerome Blake, and despite his power of personality, they knew he was very much a human being, and did not exactly give off the air of divinity even in his knowledge. He was a flawed person, just like anyone else, even if he had been their leader. The way Toyama now described him, to them, people who knew Jerome, was beyond fantastical. The atmosphere in the room must have been extremely uncomfortable. Later, those who believed in the divine word of Blake would say that this was because they were confronted by the irrefutable truth and wisdom of Jerome Blake's sacred and holy texts for the first time in full assembly. Those who found out about these events later, the more secular Comstar and other privileged individuals, believed that the council members were either shocked by Toyama's naked delusion or were stunned by the example of what is an obvious and clear mental breakdown. With the First Succession War, the collapse of the Terran state, the death of Jerome Blake, their leader, it's easy to imagine the council believing that Toyama had simply snapped. They themselves had also gone over a similar cliff, just one which had belief that they could turn back time with an inadequate military force. The meeting would conclude. They were to reconvene later to go over the two, quite frankly, crazy proposals. One, which was to conquer the Inner Sphere by force of arms, and the other was to declare Jerome Blake's words a sacred and holy text. Conrad had lied about this, however, and had no intention of reconvening the First Circuit Council meeting. At least not yet. The head of ROM, Michel Dupree, had been the only other person Jerome Blake had given any information on his plan to, and knew to support Conrad in his bid for power her allegiance being secured before all of this took place. She would meet with Toyama almost immediately after the council went into recess. There would be a purge of those who would not, or could not, operate inside of the First Circuit or any other important role inside of Comstar, with ROM agents being the angels of death for those who would no longer belong in the organization. Herman Schweppes was abducted interrogated for all of his major supporters' names, and then was executed by the ROM team which had assailed him. Even during this, three other council members were assassinated as well, quietly being removed. All of this happened within 48 hours, 
The Purge is one of the bleakest, darkest moments in the history of an organization, at least internally, as the bloodletting didn't stop at the top. Anyone not suspected of being loyal or being a problem was done away with, now all the way down to lowly technicians. People were transferred to new positions, even if the main crime was just not being loyal enough to the idea of Comstar. From there, they would be placed into camps, where they would often be tortured for information, or any crime that needed to justify their end. Many died slow, excruciating deaths. Others who openly questioned their new ideals and religion would quietly vanish, not even being reassigned to camps. Already at the beginning of this, the mission of Comstar was compromised, and not by these victims, but by the actions of those who removed them. Jerome Blake was a man with a big picture, and by the end of his life he had compromised himself by allowing wars to rage on, or by intervening to extend conflicts. But this was another level of depravity. 20% of the people who worked for Comstar, 20% of the people who Conrad Toyama was responsible for the safety of, as the Prime Administrator, were callously murdered or ruthlessly imprisoned for life in a soul-crushing concentration camp. This was done by Toyama and Michel Dupree. Comstar, in Toyama's bid to create a religion, had already created the first zealots. The ones Blake warned about prior to his death. Raw mutants would be used to fill the vacancies in the First Circuit, giving the intelligence service more power, but also ensuring that Toyama would never be challenged. In 48 hours, the world had changed, and no one outside of Comstar would have known. Even many within who were now scared and uncertain might have suspected what was going on, but never truly knew. This was what a coup d'etat looked like. Into the first new session of the First Circuit, Toyama would reshape Comstar into the order he needed it to be. The corporate system was dismantled, and instead a new structure known as the Comstar Order took its place. No longer did they have trainees, but acolytes. Technicians would become adepts. Other ranks of various sorts were founded, replacing former positions. This appeared across the organization and at every level. Even the Prime Administrator was now simply referred to as the Primus. The greatest change was anyone who now wished to join Comstar would never know life outside of it again. To join the Order was to join for life. Those within the organization, knowing what had happened to one in five of their friends and co-workers, even if they didn't support this measure, or any of these measures, remained quiet. In a rare act of humanity, House Davian, under First Prince Paul Davian, perhaps for their own benefit, but taking a risk all the same for people's lives, would offer sanctuary to any technicians fleeing the internal repression within Comstar after the discovery of some of these events. There were individuals who took up this offer. Unfortunately, upon discovery, now Primus Toyama would reach out to Paul Davian, and informed him that if these people were not immediately returned to Comstar as a part of their internal investigation, all services would be cut to the Federated Sons. Within three days, all of the refugees who had flocked to Davian Space were returned, their fates being sealed. None of the other House Lords did anything, especially after they heard what happened. Comstar had been an organization created by Jerome Blake, it was created to service mankind, and help to protect the Terran hegemony and Star League, even in its faltering days. Years of disappointment, despite limited successes, jaded a good man and turned him into a desperate one. Despite its name change, as well as different corporate initiatives, it was the Department of Communications under Jerome Blake, the last bastion of the Star League's government. After his death, the department was no more. What followed in his passing was something new. Thousands would die, their blood figuratively pouring down the streets of Terra, washing away the old in their suffering, and with the end of their lives. Their deaths, and the changes that followed, created something new. This painful event was the birth pains of what would be the real emergence of the organization whose name is now thought of when one speaks of Blake's religion. Mysticism, 
intelligence agents, and religious zealotry were the organization now. It no longer resembled what it had been beyond the most basic functions. Comstar was born the day the last refugee and dissenter died. The word of Blake was born on that day. The Blessed Order was born on that day. At the center of the dome structure was Blake, the relic, embalmed and preserved with a hideous process. The remnant of his friend looked slightly artificial, surreal, as if it were manufactured from plastics and fabrics. Conrad touched the glass nearest the face and sobbed, once. It came forth like an involuntary cough, and he felt his sadness clench down painfully on his throat. Many describe seeing the Blake relic as an uplifting, comforting experience. They would say it filled them with hope, but the preservation of his friend only brought back memories of Jerome just after he had stopped breathing. The memories of a sudden emptiness that had filled him, the enormity of which surprised him then, as it did now. Every time he really remembered that moment, he would struggle to not be absorbed by the extent to which he missed his friend and mentor. I... I'm afraid, Jerome. The moment is here. I thought... I thought the moment was at your cabin, but... If I do nothing now... I think this fire will burn down to a smolder. Yet if I push... I think it might burn for another century. So far, my actions have been minor. Little more than propaganda. I could have done... More. But I fear... I fear we will be cursed for our plan. That history will not see us as saviors, but as instigators. You and me both. If I do this wrong, they'll name warships after me, or battle mechs. I'm not sure this is still the right course. I can still walk away and see what... and see what happens. They had learned nothing. There had been no progress, no awakening, and no realization of what mankind now blindly was doing to itself. Conrad stood up and turned towards Blake. I may never know if this is the right decision, but I've only got one move to make, and to do nothing now is a greater evil. When trillions decide to do nothing, at least I decide to act. He turned to move away, but stopped himself. With a calmer voice, he continued. If you're just a symbol now, then let that symbol be of change and of improvement. Of the ideas of humanity's growth. Of us taking responsibility for all that we are capable of doing. If I can succeed in that, well, then praise be on to Blake. And let those who say it with actual sincerity be good people. He began to walk towards the exit. He powered on his communicator and then opened a channel. Michelle passed the package along to Jeanette. A tragedy was born on the day Comstar was. Conrad Toyama failed. And that failure would echo across the ages. Thank you for joining me here today. It was very important to me that I cover this the best way that I could. I've always had a sincere love for Comstar ever since I was a child. And crafting the script for this video, as well as the video itself, with respect, was something that weighed heavily on me for some time. Getting to go through the characters' lives in some ways, taking that journey with them as I researched it and scripted it, was a very heavy thing especially when it came to having to voice them later. The resources I used to craft this will be posted in the video description, including links to their appropriate pages should you wish to purchase them for yourselves. I do recommend them, they are both great reads. I'm sure there will be plenty of debate from people if I did a good job, or if I did not, or about the contents that are within this video. 
And if you did enjoy this video, please consider hitting the like button. It does help this video a great deal. But all the same, a huge thank you. A huge thank you to all of the YouTube members on this channel. When you hit the join button and become a member, you take an extra step in supporting the content on this channel, and these kinds of videos would flatly not be possible without your support. And this video itself was done as a part of our membership goals for the month of August. May Blake's wisdom bless you. I will catch you all in the comment section below.